All right, good morning, Sacramento. This is Craig Ashton. Show is all things legal, personal injury, attorneys distilling topical events into their legal essence. What does that mean? Well, guess what? We are attorneys by trade, curious by nature. So our goal, because, you know, got all this stuff going on. It looks like the pandemic might be behind us, knock on wood, going in the right direction. <laughs> and ultimately, you know, we've got financial issues, especially if you're in the service uh, economy. So what we try to do is uh, basically go far afield for stories that have a legal bent, make sure they're not about you, make sure they're not political. We want to raise your IQ, lower your blood pressure, make you the most interesting conversationalist at your next orange-controlled dinner party. Uh, I don't know what the colors are. Red usually means... Uh, stop and that's kind of a good thing orange is a better thing and then purple is a bad thing we need we need to you know you have to have like uh, you know einstein iq to figure out what's going on but the good news is it's going in the right direction this show hopefully will make you laugh definitely uh, allow you to go far afield from any stresses that you're having and i'm joined this morning by edward alan shady yes i just got out of my double lockdown put in by <laughs> you know governor newson double special lockdown first you gotta lock yourself in your house then you gotta lock yourself in the smallest room in your house <laughs> and now you gotta get past the lockdown that your wife has imposed upon you true <laughs> and then the good news is uh, we might be going uh, slightly national on the show so uh, oh. we're definitely in discussions about going into uh, san diego and uh, los angeles and san francisco etc so that's kind of cool so if you are a person that's listening to the show for a while you knew us when and at the end of the day, let me break down the stories for you so you can determine whether or not you want to spend the next hour of your existence engaged in this experience. Tiger Woods, still in the news. Remember, he was in an accident, single car accident. They did not do a uh, test to determine whether or not he was under the influence of drugs. They didn't have a drug uh, specialist at the scene. So there's a question as to whether or not they did any sort of toxicology test on his blood. But they did get the black box, and now there's evidence that he didn't hit the brakes at all. And as a matter of fact, he had his foot on the accelerator, perhaps, for the entire accident. He is unbelievably fortunate that he did not hit somebody head on and kill somebody. Uh, there was an accident just uh, a couple days ago on Highway 5 where pulled over a big rig, tow truck, cops, uh, the police officers were trying to slow down the traffic, and somebody basically hit the uh, police officers. The three people in the Subaru were killed. So what happens when you're not paying attention? Really bad things. A so tiger is very, very fortunate. But at the end of the day, when he says, I don't remember the accident, uh, he said it at the scene and also said at the hospital, I don't remember anything about the accident, then that is a suggestion that something may have been going on that called into question his ability to understand the incident. And it's not about a concussion. It, he could have been under the influence of uh, either prescription or over-the-counter medication. So they're looking into that now. And so we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the NC2A tournament. We get the fair uh, pay to play act in california which goes into effect january 2023 basically what it says is hey um you can sell your name your likeness etc you can go ahead and represent ashton and price we could pay you fifty thousand bucks to pay for pl play for cal um just you basically will be a spokesperson for ashton and price uh, ultimately it's going to change the dynamic where kids want to go to school and then florida saw that coming and they passed a similar law which goes into effect july of this year and then uh, the, there's another state, I think it's Colorado, passed a similar law. So the point is it's all going in that direction whereby there's an antitrust issue, which is the NT, NC2A, has total control over the economic dynamics. And people are saying, look, you're masquerading as an educational enterprise, but you're really a commercial enterprise that's worth billions of dollars. And the coaches, if, if somebody came down from outer space and tried to figure out what was going on, you see a guy who's 55, looks like he's uh, definitely obese, yelling at the players that are making the points and, and scoring, and he's making two and a half million bucks a year, and the kids are only getting a, a, an education. Simone Biles actually turned down a scholarship at UCLA so she could promote herself before the Rio Olympics. That makes no sense. And if, and if you're a, uh, a, somebody who has a scholarship for music or a scholarship for acting, guess what? You can sell your music while you're in school. Uh, you can have an acting class. But a kid who plays basketball can't even have a basketball camp. That's in violation of the NC2A rules. Makes no sense to me. We'll discuss. We got the Lakers and the, and the Kings suing under contracts because of COVID-19, losing all this business. The Kings have an $850 million uh, contract to say, look, in the event that there is something that is unforeseen that we can't control and we're not able to have games, have concerts, doco shut down, uh, we, we want to be compensated. Now, Lakers, same thing. And the two insurance companies, Chubb and then the uh, insurance company for the Kings, basically have denied the claims. Now there's lawsuits. It's going to be interesting because you're going to see very deep pockets going after lots and lots of money. And those cases usually get litigated all the way to the end unless a settlement is entered into. There's a big difference between having a claim and having a win. 
Because when I used to do defense work, clients would get sued and they would be totally fearful of what's going on. I say, go to the last page right above the where the attorney signs the uh, complaint. Go three or four lines up past everything they're asking for. What does it say? It starts off with, we pray for, I go, yeah, it's a prayer. Not all prayers are answered. <laughs> and, and you're Catholic, Ed. So, I mean, when Mine you're are saying answered. That, <laughs> I even slept through a meeting with the Pope. Yeah, you did. <laughs> that was the greatest story. You're in Rome. You, you basically, you, you have your alarm. You, you cut in line to get past the Swiss guards to get into the Vatican. They put you on the Pope meeting list, and you just slept through it. I slept through it the next day. I was supposed <laughs> to get up and go have my meeting with the Pope and missed it. You are that pious where no. you do, it doesn't matter to you. I, mean, I you, went to you, confession. <laughs> Yeah, back in the day of indulgences, I mean, you just throw down, you know, 50 bucks and you're out. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is good news. So saliva test boosts efforts to detect con- concussions in rugby. So apparently there's a molecular change in the sal- saliva after a concussion in a rugby because these guys are maniacs. I mean, they don't wear a helmet. It's basically like pro football. They're big guys run the same speed, but they don't really have the same uh, padding that NFL players have. <laughs> And guess what? They test the saliva afterwards, and they've got lots of empirical evidence now, and they can come up with a uh, clinical conclusion as to whether or not there is a molecular change in the saliva that can determine that you actually have a concussion. Because the problem that you have with concussions right now, and we have it all the time in auto accidents, somebody will go in, they'll do a concussion protocol, and the only test they really do is a CAT scan. And the CAT scan usually comes back normal. It doesn't mean you don't have a concussion or some sort of neurological deficit as a result of the accident. It's just that the test is not specific enough to pick up on that neurological change. If you can determine that you definitely have a concussion based upon the evidence which is measurable in your saliva, that's a good first step forward. Yeah, no, it, it, it's an objective test as opposed to currently right now it is an interview by a, a medical professional to determine whether or not you had a concussion. Yeah, so this way we have some actual objective evidence to say, you know, I always say, uh, you know, if, I, if my wife tells me a headache, maybe she just doesn't like me. But if she has a CAT scan that says she has a subdural hematoma, I get it, right? So the point is, is that in a personal injury case, there is a societal stereotype that people exaggerate for financial gain. So it's very nice when you say, look, my head hurts, and then they do a saliva test. They go, yep, you definitely show objective findings. They have a concussion, and here are the protocols you need to follow. Because fortunately, most of our clients don't have a subdural hematoma, which is bleeding on the brain. And if you have that, you're not talking to me because you're in a coma. Yeah, the biggest thing that's will come into play is the NFL. Right now, somebody gets hit pretty bad, and then they look like they're staggering on the field. They bring him into the little tent, do a concussion protocol, determine whether or not they're going to finish the game or not. Now they can do a saliva test uh, yeah, right there on the spot. Yeah, which is great. Because post, post-traumatic encephalopathy, the only way you can determine that is through autopsy, which you don't want because that means you're dead and they're slicing through your brain. So this is a way better test, right? Uh, yeah, I do want to know, but I'd like to survive. So just give me a saliva test. I'll, I'll, the autopsy thing, we'll, we'll hold that as a last resort. All right, detective divorcing wife after she was seen in videos at U.S. Capitol right with another man. So not only posting videos of breaking the law, but also cheating on the husband, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Florida man arrested for, for basically getting frisky with a pickle Ooh. on private property. Yeah, jeez. No. That's, uh, <laughs> that is not the way that you're supposed <laughs> he's, to. He's not going to be a spokesman. Yeah, Mr. Pickle's for, not, not happy about that. <laughs> Blastic. Florida man named Baby Cape is caught naked in chair outside apartment complex. Another Florida man with nudity involved. Sheriff's office, Florida man arrested, found hiding from deputies in dryer. So he tried to get away scot-free. He thought he could get a clean getaway, clean his record. He had to get out of the dryer. But at least he didn't get bitten by the, the dogs like he did before. And this guy, Florida man in motorized scooter, he's 80. So this is a contrarian octogenarian, exposes himself to shoppers at Walmart. So I don't know what it is about Florida. It's got to be something in the water. But I think (laughs) 75% of the stories we're going to talk about all have uh, criminal legal consequence, but they go a la carte. Hey, was it uh, da Gama that was in Florida looking for the the Fountain of Youth? Vasco da Gama, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, there it is. It's in the water. (laughs) Exactly, (laughs) yeah. It's it's on aisle eight in Walmart. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> All right, so when we come back, we'll go ahead and talk about Tiger Woods and the ongoing investigation. The black box to determine whether or not he, uh, how he acted prior to the accident has now given some data to the uh, police law enforcement. So we'll talk about that. And there is evidence that he didn't even hit the brakes and what the legal consequence might be. Stay with us. All right, we are back when I say we, Craig Fontaine, Acid, Edward Allen, Shady, EAS, if it's in the game, it's in the game. Good to be here. I'm going to put a face to voice, go to AstonPrice.com or AstonPrice LLP. We are digitally recording the show. Today, I'm paying homage to UCLA Bruins, made us to Sweet 16. My dad went to UCLA, my law partner, Chris Price, went to UCLA, his brother went to UCLA, his dad went to UCLA, my stepdaughter, Tatiana, went to UCLA, my brother, I think I said, spent eight years at UCLA, undergrad, not because he was a slacker, but he got his uh, undergrad and his JD MBA, did it all in eight years. 
So that's a lot of time. So he got JD, MBA, and undergrad from UCLA. Uh, so I got in my, you know, my dad gosh, just grew up as a UCLA fan. I ended up going to Cal. Turns out I found out that UCLA stole our colors and our fight song. But as uh, any UCLA fan will say, UCLA made the fight song famous. <laughs> so I am wearing a blue and gold suit and uh, bow tie today. And so ultimately, if you want to put a face to voice, go ahead and check that out. And my beautiful wife, because anybody who knows, knows that I got total hip replacement surgery 13 or 14 days ago today. Right. And I've got a driver for the probably another week at least. And uh, Tanya gave me her cool glasses, which match my outfit. So if you just want to get the visage of what we look like while we do the show, do that uh, on Ashton and Price LLP or AshtonandPrice.com. All right. So let's talk about Tiger Woods. So anybody who knows Tiger Woods was involved in a single car accident in Palos Verdes, took out the sign, Welcome to Rolling Hills. <laughs> <laughs> And then basically, it was 7 o'clock in the morning. He was going to a shoot. He had spent the day before uh, with David Spade and others. And, you know, th- there's no evidence that there's any alcohol or drugs involved, at least illegal drugs. And so ultimately lost control, went over the center median, took out a sign, went into oncoming traffic, then veered back across onto his lane of traffic, hit a tree, hit an uh, embankment, and then uh, basically had very significant fractures to his legs. He may have exacerbated the pre-existing condition that he had, which led to five surgeries in his lumbar spine and also has an ankle injury. It's the ankle and the lumbar spine injuries, at least from my experience and yours, Ed, over the last 27 years of doing this, that those are the injuries that are ultimately going to lead to problems. For me with my hip replacement, because my joint is completely replaced, I'm assuming that my ceramic ball and the titanium and the socket in my hip doesn't fail. I should be fine because they basically cut off the top of my femur and, and drilled a hole in and put the prosthesis in. If that heals, I should be fine because it's basically not a hinge. Uh, but when you're dealing with a knee or an ankle or, in Tiger's case, his lumbar spine, that's a hinge. Uh, and if his uh, tibia, fibula f- a heal, then he should be fine. But it's uh, those injuries that are problematic. The short-term problems that he has right now is that uh, there was a cr- crash test that was carried out now. And it shows that Woods never took his foot off the accelerator. And this is according to a recent article. And almost as if he had not noticed the impending collision. Uh, There is evidence that the police officers looked at the black box. The first deputy, Carlos uh, Gonzalez, arrived minutes later or after the accident on February 23rd, said that Woods appeared to be in shock but was conscious and was able to answer basic questions. So, you know, do you know where you are? Those type of things. So those are basic questions that would say, okay, this guy is at least oriented to time and place right now. So then he was asked about the accident at the scene and also at the hospital. And he said he didn't remember the accident at all, either when asked at the scene or asked at the hospital. So the question becomes, is that just because of the trauma he sustained? Uh, is it a head injury that ultimately, if they did the saliva test, they could determine right off the bat? Because they probably did a CAT scan and it probably came back normal. Uh, hopefully knock on wood, but that's usually what you see because right? what they're looking for is any sort of lividity or bruising or bleeding on the brain. If you don't have that right on, then you can move on to the, the less uh, emergent uh, I- issues. You but, it, no, but it's pretty clear from the article that the first person on scene uh, was a neighbor. They came down, heard the crash, came down to his mangled SUV and found Tiger unconscious, which if it was because of jarring to his head, et cetera, would be a clear indication of loss of consciousness for a concussion in this matter. And then by the time the officer showed up, yeah, he was out of his, he was conscious, but able to answer questions and ask the guy to make sure his agent got his golf bag. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but, but the point is, is he unconscious because he's uh, too high in ambient, or is he t- unconscious because of oxycodone? Well, that's all, that, or is no, he that's unconscious all because of a head injury? Or because he fell asleep. Right, or because he fell asleep. But if it's 7.30 in the morning, that, let's put it this way. If Tiger Woods hits my client, right, and I want to investigate this case, and Tiger Woods comes up with this story, you know what I say? File a complaint today. I'm going to go ahead and subpoena. I'm going to make sure that that car gets protected. I'm going to have somebody take a look at that. I'm going to get the black box. I'm going to subpoena his medical records. And then at that point, I'm going to find out how it is at 730 in the morning, a healthy guy, one of the world's best golfers, best athletes on the planet, a guy that wanted to become a Navy SEAL, falls asleep and does not remember, didn't hit the brakes, hit the accelerator before an accident, if it's just a weird happenstance. Well, because it sounds to me like there might be something going on. And as a plaintiff's lawyer, I want to know. Because if he's under the influence, guess what? You get what you get, and I'm going to sue you for punitive damages. Well, number one, if I was the defense attorney, you would never get any of that information. We'd just admit liability, and from that point forward, you wouldn't be entitled to any of that material <laughs> because it would just be a damages claim. I would because I, pl- I plead gross negligence. This would be his second DUI. And at that point, I'd be asking for punitive damages, and I would need to know if he's under the influence of alcohol. Yeah, file a motion for summary judgment. Because one of the things you have to show in a punitive damages claim in the state of California is a, it's a higher standard. There are, two, there are three standards of proof in the state of California. 
it's beyond a reasonable doubt, clear and convincing what's the middle standard, and that's the standard you have to prove uh, for a punitive damages claim, and then the lowest standard, uh, uh, preponderance, which is more than 50%. So those types of claims are quite often subject to most for summary judgment, because I used to have to file them when I was doing defense work. Somebody would come after my client for... Uh, punitive damages, I'd file those motions, was successful on them. So it, it's a tough claim, but in this instance, there's nothing to indicate that he did anything illegal other than an infraction at this point in time for driving you know, over the speed limit and uh, not staying in his lane. Well, what, what they're looking for and, and, and what the, the officer is now saying, if someone is involved in a road accident, we need to reconstruct the collision to determine if it was reckless driving and to determine whether or not a crime was committed. Uh, because just because you're Tiger Woods doesn't mean the state of California gives you a, a free pass. And if you can't say that you don't, if you say that you don't remember the accident, then at that point they need they need to look in to see you know why. Is, uh, it, is, is it a head injury? Yeah. Okay. Explain. Let's move on. There's no crime here. Or you fell asleep. And then if the question becomes why at 7:30 in the morning are you falling asleep behind a wheel of a car? Well, the other thing is uh, like I mean, have you ever fallen asleep behind a wheel of a car? Yes, but the car was parked. <laughs> <laughs> Taking a nap. But seven thirty in the morning while you're going to a photo shoot and you fall asleep. I mean, that to me, as a plaintiff's lawyer, man, you don't get to tell me that you don't remember. I want to know. And there's going to be evidence. Hey, maybe it will be exculpatory. You then, you, yeah, okay, sorry, sorry that I that I wanted to look, but I looked, and you got to look. And in this case, I think you got to look. I don't know. There's, you know, pull the pull the curtain back. I don't think you're going to find anything here. Besides that. The whole argument by the action reconstruction is, all oh, we have to bring out a drug recognition expert. Really? You're going to hold him at scene with a broken leg, a man who's had a concussion? No, your first duty as an officer is to secure the scene and to make sure that the safety and well-being of all parties involved, including the perpetrator in this instance, Tiger Woods, is taken care of. And that would have been transport to the hospital. Yeah, so the drug recognition expert would just be like the subpoena for the black box, which is the right to privacy. But if you have a drug recognition expert said, Your Honor, I believe there's probable cause for us to investigate whether or not Tiger Woods was under the influence of some sort of substance that caused him not to remember the accident and, not, and basically not remember the accident. And so ultimately, then at that point, there would be a warrant to get a blood test for him to determine whether or not that they could take a look specifically for the elements of toxicology that are important to answer that question. Because when you go into the surgery, looking at your platelets, they're basically looking at your blood pressure. They're looking to see whether or not you have any other any obvious issues that pertain to your inability to go under anesthesia. But they're not necessarily they're not required to look for you know opioids and all of those. But things. they do because they don't want to give somebody anesthesia that may have a contra you know a contraindication on a drug. If you take this drug to put somebody under under and their amphetamines or something else in the system. It could have a detrimental effect. So they do check for it. They just can't check to the volume of it. Yeah, but if it's true that the black box is going to show, because it's unclear what they're relying upon. They just said crash test. I don't know what that means. Oh, they would have done a computer makeup because if he'd hit the brake, there's no way he would have gone up the hill and, and come all the way around, took out that much of the... The damage to the front of his vehicle and the crush damage can say he was doing about this speed approximately when this occurred, which would indicate that he never did hit the brake. But at the same time, when you go over the curb and your foot is knocked off the accelerator, it may not be near the brake, or who knows, maybe the guy was driving with the uh, cruise control on in town, which he shouldn't be doing, fell asleep, and it stayed in acceleration mode as it went through this entire process. It's, I mean, you know, having done this for 27 years, this is an outlier. You don't re really get facts like this where somebody— It is weird. Ha it is involved in an appreciable distance traveled where take, you know, hit a median, hit a sign, cut across into oncoming traffic, go back into your traffic, hit a tree, and there's no brakes are hit at the entire time. Yeah, he didn't roll over the rolling hill sign. He plowed through. No, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> rolling hills is uh, reevaluating whether or not he's welcome. It's going to be plowing hills now. Yeah, right. Plowing hills. No, I'm just, you know, because I'm defending poor Tiger here. Somebody's got to stand up. You're doing a good up. job. Somebody's I mean, got to stand up for the poor You almost man. got me not to seek uh, that evidence, but I'm, I, I want <laughs> it. <laughs> so the point is, is that, hey, you know, bottom line, like like we talked about the boss. I mean, he was drinking some tequila with some fans. He got Got arrested and then he did a blood alcohol test he blew a 0 0.02 and then he came out that said hey i blew a 0 0.02 i'm not even drunk in utah leave me alone and you know what they said yeah you're the boss good job you can handle your alcohol you did tequila you're cool with your fans plus you weren't dui and then he gets an apology so if tiger woods if he's not under the influence what i would have had my, my staff do is do it look man i'm not an influence in anything I, I stayed up too late i was playing video games whatever it was right and then, you know, let's release my toxicology so I don't have to deal with any of this because getting better is hard enough. And when people are questioning my behavior based upon the fact that I have a pre-existing 
behavior problem with opioids and Ambien. I mean, a video of him being arrested. He thought he was in California when he was in Florida. Let's just stop it because then we don't talk about this and we just move on to the NC2A. Well, just revoke his license. The guy that rich and famous shouldn't have his own driver anyways. Yeah, I don't know why he's driving exactly. himself around. I mean, there's Uber, Uber, Lyft, Uber. limo, helicopter. I mean, I'm sure you can get Oprah on the horn. She can send up the helicopter. Out. I'm sure he's got more than a million dollars in the bank. <laughs> he could just have a full-time driver. Right, exactly. All right, so let's talk about the NC2A. So right now, if you're watching, so I, I like to say that uh, Cal's at unbeaten in the NC2A for the last two years. At least, True. Because we haven't played. <laughs> but we are unbeaten. So if you want to look at it half full, we are unbeaten. I have not lost in cricket in 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> but we got UCLA going Sweet 16. The Pac-12 is doing great. You got Oregon, USC, I think Colorado's still in it, UCLA, etc. So right on for the Pac-12. But <laughs> some people are pointing out it is really odd to watch, especially during COVID, where you see these kids who were quarantined and all this other stuff. Uh, basically, you know, playing their hearts out, and you got the the coaches who are making two, three, four million bucks a year. And said, if you were a an alien came down and you saw that, and you would say, "There, those guys that don't play, the ones yelling at the people that are playing, are making two and a half million bucks a year. What do the other guys get? Oh, they're getting a great education." Well, um, s- somebody pointed out it was really so. Basically, the NC2A is a multi billion dollar com- commercial entertainment enterprise masquerading as a tax-exempt educational pursuit. I mean, it really isn't, man. This is billions of dollars. And it's what a great gig you can have when you don't have to pay your employees. It'd be like doing blockbusters all the time and Brad Pitt basically gets uh, food and, and, and board, you know, uh, during a, a, ma- a massive blockbuster movie. I mean, there's blockbuster movie dollars that are being paid. So California got ahead of it, said, you know what? Ed O'Bannon started it because he sued, uh, basically saw his likeness in a video game. He goes, I'm not going to pay for that. How come? Well, because, you know, that's uh, when you played at UCLA and you get paid money when you play basketball. You just get an education. He said, that's not cool. I should be able to sell my likeness. I should be able to own my likeness. That's me, man. That's not the NC2A's property. So ultimately, that went a long way. So Gavin, uh, Gavin Newsom is in the uh, California passed the Fair Pay to Play Act. It says, look. Starting January 2023, all athletes can basically sell their likeness. They can be on video games. They can have uh, basketball camps. They can represent uh, Roseville Toyota if they want to, or, or McCoonies or Ashton and Price. That's up to them. That's not going to affect their amateur status. Stay with us. We'll talk about that, and then we'll go ahead and talk about the saliva test uh, and the Lakers. It's going to be interesting. All right, we are back. When I say we, Craig Fontaine, Ashton, Edward, Allen, Shady. So we put all things legal, personal injury, attorneys, distilling topical events, and do legal lessons. We go far afield. Basically, I think I got a, an article from Tennis Magazine. I got Sports Illustrated. I got the Sacramento Bee, San Francisco Chronicle, Washington Post, New York Times. It sometimes even goes as deep as Vogue Magazine. Anyway, to kind of drill down on topical legal events to give you a perspective from a lawyer's perch. Uh, Edward Allen Shady. Shady, hey. attorney, give you some legal direction. You didn't get anything from Pravda this week? Pravda, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no VI, no Pro-VI. Uh, so basically, don't take the lack of gravitas, the mirth, the levity to be something you can play with what we do for a living. You know, I had uh, surgery uh, last Wednesday. In the, no, two weeks ago. Uh, two, two weeks ago. and uh, Two weeks ago on Thursday, actually. So yeah, perhaps they took about some, some of my IQ with the hip. Uh, but uh, the point is, is that uh, just before I resolved the, uh, b- before I went in for surgery, I resolved the case for six hundred fifty thousand dollars, which I've been working on for quite some time. All the uh, cobblestones have been laid on the road towards success, and then uh, Tim just resolved the case for a million dollars last week. And so, you know, those are big injury claims that we take very seriously. So don't take the lack of gravitas and levity to indicate that's how we practice law. But we want to have some fun because guess what? There's not enough fun going on in the world and people do stupid legal things and we get to talk about it. So keeping in that genre, the NC2A, right? So the Fair Pay to Play Act, California said, look, um, you know, kids ought to be able to sell T-shirts and sell autographs and have videos. And if Nike wants to sponsor them, why not? I mean, that has nothing to do with the NC2A. It's not, we're not making Cal pay them a million bucks a year, but if Nike wants to, why not? Or they want to have a basketball camp. I mean, if you are if you have a scholarship in music or acting, you can go out and sell your music, or you can go ahead and be in a blockbuster. It doesn't affect your scholarship because that's not, the school's not paying you. You're getting paid by somebody else. Well, it's different, too. When you signed up to play uh, sports in college, you also agreed to abide by the NC2A rules when you did it. Now, they can quit school or they can go play 
on a non-college team in a lesser league if they want to. But the problem is, if you start letting them sell their name, likeness, etc., then certain schools, because part of the NC2A, so you try to, and it never really happens, a level playing field. And if I'm going to be in a big-name team that's going to be on TV more often, I'm going to have more of a chance to get something for my name or likeness, and therefore a smaller school is not going to be on the same recruiting field as anybody else. And so... I don't have a problem with somebody going, okay, it's my name or likeness. You cannot use it without giving me a royalty. But to keep moving it up into a semi-pro or t- typical like pro-type atmosphere, then I think that the athletic department might also have to be a spinoff from the school because it's now going to be a for-profit enterprise and it's going to lose its non-profit taxable status. Well, here's what's, here's what's happening. So right now, California's got the fair pay to play. It doesn't happen until January 2023. Colorado passed a very similar law, same thing, January 2023. Florida said, hey, we got Florida man. We won't be outdone. And, uh, you know, if we have to, we'll play naked. But they have the same rule now that you can sell your likeness and basically, you know, sell autographs, et cetera. But that goes into effect July of this year. So now the NC2A has got a little bit of fire uh, on their feet. And so guess what? They had a meeting in January of this year. They announced that they will definitely delay the vote after receiving a letter from the Justice Department to hold off on the decision because they were going to basically adopt new rules that were very similar to California, Colorado, and Florida because they they can see it coming. So the only way that they basically are able to stop this, if they say, look, Congress, we need a federal law which will supersede state law because of sovereignty that says this is how it's going to be dealt with because this is a national problem and ought to be dealt with on a national basis. Uh, Ultimately, that's going to be a difficult argument for them to make. Uh, because California has taken the lead in regards to admissions. And, you know, a lot of states have said, you know, well, this is not cool. And, and the manufacturers say this is not cool because we have to make cars based upon California when Texas has a totally different admissions uh, law. But so far, the states have had uh, their laws upheld. Objection. Assumes facts, not evidence. Does Texas even have an admission standard? <laughs> <laughs> so, so the point is, is now what, what's going to happen is the NC2A – when, when, and when they press on this, then the, the individuals like Ed O'Bannon, and these pe- people have now money because some of them have gone on, and they're still crusaders for this to say, hey, athletes ought to be able to have autographs. I mean, if you're a good basketball player and you want to have a basketball camp and you can't even make money on that, I mean, what, what's wrong with our system? So what they're saying is that if you press it, we're going to press antitrust, which means NC2A, you have a monopoly. And guess what? That is not good for our system. You control the dynamic of basically paying these coaches like uh, Nick Saban, I don't know, 10 million bucks a year, plus all the endorsements he gets. And what the kids barely graduate from college. I mean, what is a degree from University of Alabama worth? Not that much. And so the bottom line is a coach makes 15 million bucks. He goes through all these people that he's uh, monetizing their their athletic ability. And then they go on and they basically have no health care going forward, even if they got injured. Uh, They basically have uh, their their uh, scholarship and their degree. Maybe they don't even get one. And then at the end of the day, still the coach is making 16 million bucks. And because it's a monopoly, because there is no other industry in the world where the talent that you have that is leading you to make that sort of profit doesn't get paid. Name one. Husbands. (laughs) (laughs) Husbands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is why you unlocked that. <laughs> yeah, but when you get into the article, I mean, even the uh, Pac-12 said it is afraid the law will be very significant negative consequences, unintended consequences of the law. This is typical feel-good, uh, you know, legislation out of the state There's, of California. Why is it fair? It's, it's capitalism, man. What the heck's fair got to do with anything? you got to have an even playing field going forward. This creates confusion. It creates a, an uneven playing field going forward. And at the end of the day, you're going to have consequences that nobody intended. They're going to be detrimental at the, at the end of the day, in my opinion, at some point in time. Dude, when we have an even playing field and your choice is get paid a million bucks and go to Cal or get paid 100,000 bucks and go to Alabama, you're going to Cal. And, or you're going to Stanford or you're going to USC or you're going to UCLA. You're not going to Alabama or North Carolina State. You ain't. Well, then go play pro because now you're picking your schools not on you, what you want to study or what you're going to do, but on what you're going to make in college and not necessarily what you're going to do with the rest of your life because most of these individuals do not go on to play professional sports. The vast majority don't. That's, so their education is their fallback. And if they're not going to rely on that, that's too bad. That's why it's important for them to make money now so you and I as taxpayers don't supplement when they don't have an ability to earn a, earn a crust yeah, later on. They're 18 or 21 years old and you're going to give them a lot of money. 
money. You know how long Why they're going to have it? No. You know how long they're going to have it? About a year and a half, and then they'll be broke again, and they still will not have that education to fall back on. Well, yeah, yeah I mean, you may make that argument, but at the end of the day, that helps the local economy. Yeah, maybe. I mean, and, and who doesn't want to party with it? And then it hurts the local economy when they're on welfare at the end of the day when because they, they didn't get what they wanted. So this is what's happening. So we'll, we'll talk about the supposition. And it, So for me, it is very frustrating with over 40 Nobel Prize winners at Cal, one of the most beautiful campuses in the world, that we have a difficult time recruiting really great. You know, we have great athletes, but we just don't do that well in football and basketball. We have a great swimming team, great water polo, uh, great baseball team. You know, we have, we have really good athletics, but when you look at that campus and our history, we're the oldest school west of the Mississippi, and we can't make the NC2A tournament. Uh, we haven't been to the Rose Bowl since 1958. There's something wrong because there's no way when you choose that school and that ac- academic uh, basically background with all the connections you can make in the Bay Area and in the, the high-tech economy w- with your view being of the Golden Gate Bridge and the San Francisco skyline. It's most one of the most beautiful campuses in the world, and Alabama kicks our butt every year or Clemson. Come on, man. Something's going on. So there's no way if, you, if all things are equal, you're going to Alabama or Cal, but let's free it up. Basically, we basically monetize the skill set and the schools and the boosters can pay who they want. It's just going to be the same system right now where people are bribing no, them anyway. No, it'll we be just, a completely we just different system. We just don't system. know about it. Reggie Bush was getting paid. People get paid all the time. Look at this uh, that varsity was, blues. It, that you, was 500000 bucks you get on you're on the rowing team. That it, was, it's corrupt. That so was let's cheating. Put the, let's put the corruption out in the open and then let, let the best schools no. with the best capitalism and the best education win. And then Cal's going to be going to the Rose Bowl. Cal's going to be uh, a national champion. Not Alabama. Well, Cal, Come be, on. Cal might be even further behind you, you, you at the end Al- of the day. You know what Alabama's GDP is? It's Citrus Heights. So the, the point is, is that that state and those states cannot attract that kind of talent unless something else is going on. Because why would you want to live in Alabama if you could live in, in Westwood? Why would you? Because you don't have to live in Berkeley, maybe? I don't know. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you disband all of that then the NC2A will absolutely have no meaning because there's no way when you have all the varying laws from the varying states as to what an athlete can do in each state, the NC2A no longer exists, and then no longer you have a governing board that can actually keep some control over what allegedly or is trying to be a level playing field. It is gone. Yeah, did you see how much money those guys make? I I think the people that are in the NC2A... No, the uh, the coaches? They make a lot of money. I'm talking about the guys who actually just work for the NC2A. Oh, yeah, they make like a half a million dollar salary. It's like 2.5 million, half a million... Basically, to run a monopoly. Say, hey, hey, you guys, what do you think? Should we pay the employees, really, the ones that are making us all the money? Uh, do we have to? No. <laughs> We're not paying them. Why should we pay them? That's going to take money out of my pocket. So guess what? It is a monopoly. Usually monopolies don't stand. Finally, now— NFL's a monopoly. The, the NFL is the antitrust. Yeah, it is. And, yeah, it's and, so, is the, and so is the NBA. And, 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 so is the MLB. And, and you know who changed that was the, the Oakland Raiders. And so and, is and the And they National fought Hockey it on the antitrust, League. and they got to move from Oakland to, to L.A. They said the NFL can't stop them. So there is precedent that the NFL cannot act as a monopoly and that the individual franchises do have some ability to move their franchises around. That's why Oakland's in, in Vegas now. Well, they all have. They all agree and work with certain rules that they abide by. It's called the National Football Association. But in the same thing, that's why you have the National Collegiate Athletic Association because there are supposed to be certain rules that everybody abides by. Now, if everybody has the same rules, that that's different. But if you start professionalizing this, then you start talking about athletic programs. They're going to lose their tax exempt status. Now, we talked about this the other day. Those robotic dogs that are out of Boston Dynamics. You'll see them, they'll be doing a backpack, they sell them to the military, they might use them for uh, drug enforcement. That all came out of MIT, and because they couldn't use it as a for-profit, they spin it off so that the school doesn't lose its pro- uh, non-profit taxability. So are you going to spin off the athletic departments of all these schools, and now it's going to be just a semi-pro uh, organization that's part of a school? Well, what's going to happen is it's going to be the arguments from the individual players that it's basically a monopoly, antitrust, therefore it's illegal. So quit and go pro. Versus the NC2A saying that we need federal rules so we can maintain the status quo. So rogue states like Colorado, Florida, and California can't force us to allow these kids to actually make some money. To say, hey, Ashton Price is sponsoring me. It's not illegal. Uh, they're going to be the face of Ashton Price or the face of uh, Roseville Toyota, or they're going to have a basketball camp. That's not going to be illegal anymore. I support that. No, we're talking about how many 
kids you think are actually controlled are under the auspices of the NC2A. Everybody playing college sports. But we're talking about a few hundred high-achieving athletes that want to ruin it or change it for everybody else. You start talking about Title IX coming into action on this. You're talking about taxes coming in onto this. You're talking about all kinds of issues that are going to be associated with this that are unintended, that are just going to be detrimental in some way, shape, or form, in my opinion, to some of those non-televised sports. And back in the day, I could have been your Ruben Kincaid when you were playing the Division I water polo, put you in a Speedo. Next thing you know, you're the, you're the face of uh, Got Milk. And you're making ten million bucks. You're not even sitting here right now because you're talking to me from your island in, in the Bahamas. Who wants to be got milk <laughs> or Playgirl? <laughs> right, yeah, that's right. You were in Playgirl. <laughs> I mean, you were in Playgirl. Well, I wasn't in it. I did actually go down because I was requested to come down for a photo yeah, shoot. Yeah, and if the end got a call back, but I was out of town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same thing. You miss Playgirl and meeting with a pope. I mean, what, what guy misses both ends of the spectrum? Uh, moi. <laughs> <laughs> you had a direct line to uh, basically eternal grace. And also a direct line to nudity in a magazine, and you turn them both down. There you go. <laughs> All right, we come back. We'll talk about saliva and determining concussions, and then naked Florida man goes on a rampage, uh, and one of them with a pickle. Stay with us. Voila. All right. We are back when I said we create Fontaine Ashton. Edward Allen Shade, show we call all things legal. Personal injury attorneys is still on top of events through the legal essence. Essentially, you are not going to be able to listen to a legal show analyzed by two attorneys who, in aggregate, have over 50 years of experience, basically in litigation, uh, you know, all the way from meeting to a client, all the way through trial. And uh, then also have the accoutrement, the extra footnote of basically not returning the call to Playgirl and then not showing up to the Pope. Oh, there you have it. I mean, that, that, that is as far afield as you can get. Basically, ignoring the return phone call from Playgirl and then baseless sleeping through your meeting with the Pope. <laughs> Highlights of my life. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is a devil angel situation right there, for sure. All right. So um, let's go ahead. And so we got the saliva test, which boosts efforts to detect concussions in rugby. And you got to stay for the guy who's on private property and ask, acting inappropriately with a pickle um, and get arrested. And I don't think I've ever heard that before. <laughs> Have you? Uh, I think I'd take my pellet gun out and make something, <laughs> <laughs> make him notice. Good, good news, that's in Florida. All right. So um, saliva test to scrub academics is a game changer in the effort to detect concussions. Rugby players will be presented to the sports governing body next week in hopes to eventually could be used to diagnose head injuries in all sports, which is really cool. So uh, a study at University of Birmingham in England in collaboration with the English Rugby Authorities saw researchers take, uh, researchers take saliva samples from 156 players who had head injury assessments during matches in England's top two divisions. And ultimately, using biomarkers within the saliva, the researchers developed a test which could successfully predict the outcome of a concussion in 94% of the cases. That is pretty cool. Yeah, that, that's amazing that they have that type of accuracy. And I think it's with what, within two minutes? Yeah, and so the, the, test? Yeah, so the idea is, is that because you don't want to, if, if somebody doesn't have a concussion, you want them back in the game, right? So if the saliva test comes back normal, you could probably reasonably rely upon the fact that if the player says, I'm fine, I want to go back, you put him back in. But if the player says he's fine, because, you know, these players are tough, rugby player, football player, you know what, I don't care. You make a professional sport, you're a tough individual. Uh, if you have a positive saliva test, you can say, sorry, um, you know, we, we have some subjective findings based upon our clinical observation of you, but now we have an objective reading, which is 94% accurate to say that you have a molecular change in your saliva that ultimately leads us to conclude that you shouldn't go back into the game. <laughs> yeah, because at that time, I mean, any, any doctor worth his salt and any uh, manager for a team worth his salt is going to say, look, we don't want you messed up for the rest of your life. We don't want you messed up for weeks or months to come because the first concussion uh, – the vast, vast majority of individuals with the, within the uh, 60, you know, 30 days are back to normal. But the second concussion, it's longer, and the third concussion takes even longer. So you don't want them being concussed while they're under a concussion. So uh, kudos for them for figuring this out. I, I, my question is, how the heck did they figure it out? I, I don't know, but, I mean, you would think that it, what better, basically, environment do you have to test for concussions than basically rugby players? I, well, I guess <laughs> if somebody has a concussion, they're over there drooling. They're, oh, they're drooling. Let's test the supply box. <laughs> yeah, that, that could be just too much Guinness. <laughs> but, but what prompts you to do I mean, where does it go off the light in your head to say, hey, as a scientist, maybe we should check the saliva? 
Well, yeah, maybe because he's drooling afterwards and the body's trying to get rid of something after they've and, been and, and the beautiful thing is it's, it's not invasive and you don't have to go off site. And then if it, the saliva, the uh, biomechanical understanding as to the m- molecules in the saliva tells you that there's a change which would be consistent with uh, uh, encephalopathy, uh, uh, acute traumatic encephalopathy, then, you know, right on. That's, that's perfect. Yeah, because it says the team had previously identified that the concentration of specific molecules in the saliva changes rapidly after a traumatic brain injury. So, but I still, I can't figure out who said, hey, Frank over there got concussed. Have him spit in a cup. We're going to go test it. And then we'll have him, have everybody spit in a cup before the game so we know what their saliva is like before the game. And then we'll test them during the game to see if there's been any change. It might come in handy if you forget Valentine's Day or an anniversary. You just have this saliva test and show your wife that you do have a, a concussion. Well, the other, yes. And the other thing, too, is you'd have to go, you'd have to rule out that. That she gave you for, fitting, for forgetting the anniversary. Well, during the state of play, and even being in a concussion, let's say somebody's adrenaline pumps up, and that char- charges or changes the molecular structure. So these guys had a lot of work to do. Uh, they've done a lot of work. It'd be interesting to see uh, how it plays out. Yeah, so I, th- I think it's great. The, the more information you have for something that right now the tests are not nuanced enough to pick up on, if you can do something that objectifies it right on, that's great. You can transfer over to, you know, high school sports, lacrosse, and all that stuff, football. The more information, the better if it's reliable for sure. All right, so stupid human behavior. So a police detective in Pennsylvania has filed for divorce from his wife after she was seen in videos taking part in the riots at the U.S. Capitol with another man. <laughs> so not only does she take a picture, selfie. Uh, it's a good selfie. I mean, she's, she's, she's got very nice bone structure for sure. But at least the guy that she's with had the good sense to not only commit a crime, but take advantage of COVID. To wear a mask so he's not easily identified. For her, she said, forget it, man. I don't care if I'm committing a crime. i got to look good on Instagram. Well, at least the photograph that they have her depicted in is outside. It's not in the Capitol. You can actually see the, the bandstand behind him for where the rally was away from the Capitol. So she's not in a criminal area at the time she took the picture. Yeah, so, so there's a couple different layers, which is, A, if you're a police officer and your wife is going to Capitol riots— then that calls into question the oath that you took as a police officer. And if you supported her, then you could get fired. So he's got a potential employment issue tangentially through his wife. Then you also have a fidelity issue, which could lead to the breach of the contract, which is basically the marital contract, (laughs) which could lead to divorce. And then she's been charged with violent entry and disorderly conduct. So most of these people were just basically charged with trespass, which is a misdemeanor. But violent entry is a felony, and that could be a big one. Essentially, the response from the Pittsburgh uh, Police Department is his wife was part of that situation. He, the husband, didn't condone it. He didn't ask her to go there. He wasn't there. He was here working. So she's got a lot of explaining to do. Well, her biggest problem was she told the FBI that she stayed in a courtyard hotel. If she had stayed at a Holiday Inn Express, <laughs> she probably would have gotten away with it. Yeah, she would have been able to represent herself. Uh, are you an attorney? No, but I stayed in a Holiday Inn Express last night. Well, she admitted st- seeing the guy that uh, she has a photo with, but she also denied ever entering the Capitol on the day of the uh, incident, January 6th. So right. uh, they have to prove that she was there in order for any of these charges to stick. And again, she stayed at the wrong hotel. So we got a naked Florida man that was basically on private property. So, I mean, he can. As long as he is not visible to other people, he pretty much can do what he likes. Was this baby cakes? <laughs> no, this <laughs> is a Florida man arrested for acting inappropriately with a pickle on private property. Ooh. So essentially because it's a pickle, it's an inanimate thing. So at the end of the day, what he does to a pickle, ultimately, as long as it is not obscene, then he can do what he likes. You put a pickle on a sandwich, and you're not going to get arrested. But this guy was acting inappropriately with a pickle. His problem was is that he was with the pickle. He's also naked. And people could see onto his property, so that is lewd and lascivious conduct on his property. That is Florida man taking nudity to a whole new level, taking basically an accoutrement, a condiment, uh, could be not relishing the outcome. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's going to be condemned for using yeah. that condiment in the wrong yes, way. Yes, as you say, that is not kosher behavior. <laughs> that is dill-witted. All right, so then we've got Florida man nickname Baby Cakes. Ah, baby Cakes. Caught naked... <laughs> <laughs> in a chair outside his apartment complex. And what I really like about this guy's moniker, Baby Cakes, he's 71. 71? <laughs> These guys, yeah, they, uh, there's got to be something in the water because 71, usually your testosterone level goes down a little bit. So, you know, the nudity thing, the kind of the sexual undertones of all this behavior of guys in their 70s and 80s, man, they're, they're still rocking it out there. Hey, maybe he was air drying. Yeah, I mean, how would you like <laughs> Retirement homes must be pretty fun out there. I mean, they probably have raves like, you know, uh, 
Have a little Def Jam out there. Maybe uh, his name's Irving. Yeah. Irving Edward Howard. <laughs> little Wayne plays in the retirement community in Palm Beach. Well, the guy's got three first names: <laughs> Irving Edward Howard. There's a yeah. problem right there. His parents, you know, set him up for failure. Skrillex has got a rave at the 70 year old and over party. Well, this guy's got a major problem. I mean, from April 2019 through August 2019, this is all pre-pandemic. He was actually, you know, in forced lockdown and 134 nights in jail during that five-month period. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so Baby Cakes just has a propensity toward nudity, and he got arrested for lewd and lascivious conduct and, I think, uh, drunken disorderly. Got a Florida guy who basically tried to hide from the cops and the canines because he'd been bitten by the dogs before. They came to get him because he was in violation of his probation and they had a warrant out for him. He hid in the dryer. Was he laundering money? He tried to get away clean. <laughs> Uh, and he did, but he didn't have a clean record, <laughs> so luckily they didn't turn it on because that would have been really not the way to go. I mean, yeah. I did like uh, Brooks's uh, comment. He was heard telling the deputies, quote, that thing has my whole back twitch. I don't know what's worse, the dog or the laundry thing. Yeah, that's quote. What, if he would have put a little downy in there, it would have made it soften it up. All right, well, that's the show. Hopefully you enjoyed it. We enjoyed doing it. Covered a lot of stuff. Tiger Woods, the NC2A, stupid human behavior at the Capitol, and all kinds of craziness uh, in Florida. We'll see you next back time, next back channel. Have a great day. You've been listening to the All Things Legal Show with your host, Craig Ashton. For more information or to download the latest podcast, go to ashtonandprice.com or call 916-786-7787. Remember, for the best advice, don't think twice. Call Ashton and Price.